is actually just to spend an hour with you, I, nothing else. And uh, I so now realize that I, I thought up of this topic on the spur of the moment, thinking that I want to say something about it. But now when I really take a microscopic look at the topic, it's uh, pretty uh, large. So what I will do is I will free associate for about 45 minutes, okay? And it will be anchored to what literature has done to me, nothing else, okay? And uh, if it really does not match perfectly with the title, so be it, it doesn't matter, okay? But I'd like you to be able to take a journey for about, my intention is to speak to you for about 45 minutes and then uh, have interaction if possible. Okay, uh, while you are listening, I just want you to keep three words in mind and we'll come back to these three words from different directions and see what happens. One is simulation, second one is modulation and third one is connection. You, you got these words? Simulation, modulation and connection. If you ask somebody what is actually the true value of spending one's most productive years in literature, it is these three words. By simulation I mean there is nothing greater than literature for reality simu simulation. Uh, understand this. If you live to be 70 years, you have 6 lakh hours. That's all you have. And please understand there is something called literary awakening. My, my intention is in the next 45 minutes, if you get a fragrance or a wasp of what this literary awakening is, that's enough. Okay? The first thing is uh, you have lived all the lives of the characters you have met in your reading life. Okay? I think Jhumpa Lahari says that reading allows you to travel without moving your feet. It's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. And uh, by simulation here, we mean that uh, uh, the, the first thing you should know is uh, everybody is meandering through life and you hit the uh, ground literally running and you have to make sense uh, on the go. So the first uh, thing that makes literature valuable is that it gets you to come to terms with what I would call your thrownness. Do you understand this word, thrownness? Imagine, uh, you know, on, on the left there is pure darkness, on the right there is pure darkness, and there is a stretch of light that is 70 years of your lifespan. That's all. And it is like uh, very much like scheduling in Commerce College, which means that within a work uh, day span, there are too many associations wanting to do too many programs, too many contests. It's much like that. Our lifespan is ready to be claimed. Okay. Uh, if you don't know, you are already, see, in life, you have only one choice. Either you act or you are acted upon. Remember this. You act or you are acted upon. Literature happens to you when you take space and step back and say, okay, let me see what is happening. <coughs> so, the, the kind of literary awakening comes when first you hear your grandmother telling you stories as a kid. Okay. Uh, remember, the stuff of literature is image and sound. And uh, the way I connected to this was through the magical world of Chandamama. Have, have you ever come across this magazine? You go to Avenue Road bookshops, they, they'll have some old, uh, you know, these Chandamama uh, stories give you the privilege of customized space and time travel, okay? We, which means that uh, you can be in Avanti Nagara or you can be in Naimisharanya or you can be in Katha Sarit Sagara, all 
really brilliant, colorful. There are lots of princes, lots of, uh, you know, uh, princesses. And there's always a forest. And in the forest, there's a tree. And that happens to be a tamarind tree. And tamarind tree has an affinity for ghosts. And you have a whole set of ghosts. Some are good ghosts. Some are slightly okay ghosts. Some are terrible ones. Okay. They really go for you. Okay. They know how to make you feel miserable. Okay. So what happens is uh, you have these seeds that are, this is called sensory activation. In psychology, we call this sensory activation. Your first initiation into literature is if you are fortunate enough to be sensorily activated. And that should happen through basically your uh, I sense that it happens through mother tongue. Okay? Uh, when you are able to, uh, uh, you know, slowly identify objects, objects with images images with connections and narratives. So you, you start making color threads of feeling, words and thoughts. This is the raw material of literature. And have, unfortunately, today this job is done by Cartoon Network. Okay, because my grandmothers are busy or there are nuclear families and don't have joint families. So uh, when many people get the children to be quiet by giving the mobile and say, watch the cartoon. Okay, so uh, what what really happens uh, here? I would like to start by uh, telling you that uh, my own sensory activation was a part of. All of us are actually born into certain cultural milieu, and uh, the first uh, thing that touched me was the characters from Indian epics. Okay, uh, Mahabharata and Ramayana. Ramayana. And also Dashavataras. Okay, Dashavataras are very lovely, colorful, uh, you know. And but the problem was, uh, I could never have a relationship with these epics and uh, epic characters without the festivals and the rituals that are connected to it. So at some time, what happens around twelve or thirteen, you discover the psychic space that a book can offer. Okay, it's, it's enormous. And uh, I remember having read uh, Kanuru Hegariti of uh, Kuwempu. And I literally lived in that novel for 15, 20 days. Literally. I could smell the, you know, Malanard, uh, you know, ambience and the Handi Bete of, uh, and the kind of thick description that Kuwempu gives. And I think the biggest service that you can do to children is to read for a short while in their mother tongue, which has this kind of, we call it VAKOG, V-A-K-O-G. Please remember, V is visual, A is auditory, K is kinesthetic feelings, O is olfactory, G is gustatory. Okay, Everything that is in literature is never out there in the clouds. It is rooted in the senses. First thing you have to understand is literature is embodied experience. Okay, disembodied experiences are hallucinations. So the first thing that uh, literature teaches you is whatever blossoms here has to blossom in the anchoring of the moment here, now. Okay, and. Uh, also, this has something to do with uh, my connection to Jataka tales and Panchatantra. You know, if you just get these three things going, you have got a head start in at least literary imagination, what this is. Uh, possibly that's why I find extremely abstract dealing with literature a little tiring. Okay, but uh, if you talk to me about, uh, you know, uh, characters, that come alive, there's something uh, truly interesting. But the thing is, also, uh, Basavarna has a particular vachana which says, Atitta hogadante helavana maudai which means, uh, make me lame so that 
I don't get distracted and I stay, uh, you know, in one place. Uh, of course, Basavarna had uh, to ask for it. Some of us don't have to, we get it. Okay. So, uh, but what this actually means uh, is that uh, you, to appreciate literature, you need to have a small sense of dukkha. You understand the, this word? I'm using it in the Buddhist sense, where, uh, you know, Hamlet says, time is out of joint. Something is not fitting. It's, uh, you, you, you know how a pearl is created uh, by, an, uh, by an oyster, a dust particle gets into it and around it you have, uh, you know, a secretion. And that secretion is what uh, is your relationship with the world. That's why uh, one of the definitions of a poet is he who walks with his wounds unhealed. Look at this. A poet is one who walks around with his wounds unhealed. He is open to pain. Okay. So, uh, but essentially, uh, what happens is uh, you, you go through different kinds of experiences. So, uh, the, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, what I call the tyranny of the capital T. Please understand. Tyranny of the capital T. There is the small t, which is truth, with small. You, literature teaches you to move from one small t to another small t. It is not looking for a Kohinoor diamond, because it doesn't believe in one. Okay? What it's looking for is a pearl of experience that you gather as you go along. So, what happens uh, here is uh, the when you start reading, at, at this point, I was fortunate to come across one essay. All of us in our intellectual growth will have things like this, if you just look back. It was Shivram Karan. Have you heard of Shivram Karan? Okay. There was one essay that I read when I was in the later half of my first period. And the name of the essay was, in Kannada, it was Namma Alatayannu Miralarada Devaru. Understand this. Namma Alatayannu. Alate means measure. Miralarada Devaru. That means whatever you have imagined. Okay. It has to come, uh, it, uh, it has to be connected with your experience. So, what it uh, does is that it gives your sensibility a strong anthropomorphic uh, base. Okay, you 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 become, uh, in some sense, human being becomes the center of measure of your experience. Okay, so th that that would I, that's what I would call anchored transcendence. So when you are uh, doing this, what happens is you uh, get to see that uh, it's very, very difficult to undo a certain conditioning that you have. And not all conditionings are equally good. So literature, this is why Northrop Fry calls literature the secular scripture. Well, what is literature according to him? He says it is secular scripture, scripture that speaks to you. And then the other thing that literature does is it shows you that you are stuck in a lock of a specific sorrow. No, no, everybody is miserable. Each person's misery color is different. And each person's lock is locked in a particular way. And only a, a book that speaks to you, a voice that speaks to you, a poet that speaks to you, your condition, he can op he or she can open the lock for you. Okay. So the literature is the search for a key that unlocks you. Okay. And uh, not everybody finds it. Not everybody finds it. But uh, uh, also, it is it is something that moves you towards what is called the wisdom of uncertainty. Have you? Have you ever heard of this? Okay, wisdom of uncertainty 
Actually, wisdom of certainty is, many people are very certain. Hitler was very certain. Okay. Stalin was very certain. Right? I'm sure uh, some of our right-wingers are super certain. Okay. <laughs> and uh, when you don't, when you are so right, when you are so right, here I am using the word right in ambiguous way. When you are so right that you don't give space for the others to be wrong, there is something wrong with you. Here, please remember, it, 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 it's extremely important that there is something called literary honesty, which is very, very rare to find, very, very rare to find. When, uh, when you find it, you get a shield, and that shield is what I am talking as survival, uh, you know, uh, you know, toolkit. And if you look at, uh, have you heard of Emily Dickinson? Yes, sir. She has a, she has two, three lines. Uh, poems are very short, but luminous. She says, the soul selects her own society, then shuts the door on her divine majority of truth no more. Okay. So you you get this Vajra Kavacha of literature, which says, okay, all right. Uh, and also, very quickly you will develop a bullshit detector, okay, uh, which <laughs> politicians lack majorly, right? Much to the headache of people who are listening to them, right? So you, you, Stop this, stop. They don't even know they have started. That is the problem. Okay? This kind of cognitive insensitivity is slowly eroded by exposure to authentic literature. And this postmodern skepticism about what is authentic, we will leave aside for a while. Okay? Uh, but we will see what what has shaped, uh, you know, uh, one, uh, Woody Allen has this to say, uh, you know, Literature is the best way to, of ignoring life. Ignoring life in the sense you, are, you have an autonomous life of your own. And uh, uh, when then it comes to, so far we are talking of simula simulation is that it, you can inhabit the world of Duryodhana, you can inhabit the world of uh, Madame Bogari, you can, it, okay, all this, but what it actually does to you is modulation. Understand that. Modulation is very few of us have a small gap between stimulus and response. Hundreds of stimulus hit us all through the day, different things. And we are reactive most of the time. The small gap between that stimulus and response is the meditative gap that uh, most great writers write from. So you, you slowly become aware of your own load of reactivity that you carry. Okay, we come with we come with preloaded software glitches. Okay, that's why uh, another literary uh, line is that created sick, commanded to be whole. This is the tragedy of the human condition. <coughs> you, you, you have this, uh, diffi these difficulties. And modulation is that very, very slowly, your affective life, your emotional life is, uh, we, we, we are always caught up in our own stories, caught up in our own uh, uh, sorrows, caught up in our own uh, knots. And, uh, you know, Marcus Aurelius is the one who says, uh, the birth of a true man is slow. 
the birth of a true man is. Today's attention spans are so uh, small, we don't have attention span to watch a classic or listen to a classical uh, piece. Everything has to be bite-sized. And from bite-sized, uh, you know, engagement, you only get bite-sized insights. That is the uh, problem. So, uh, just see the time that you spend with the books. What is it doing to you? The very, very soon, you will see whether it is your frequency or not. Here, another thing is, it's not only that you read a book, the book should read you. Okay? you, you it, it's, a, it's, it's actually a dialogic uh, uh, experience, a dialogic experience. And uh, as you go along, as you uh, look at uh, uh, what this whole process is like, you tend to see that your sense of self begins to be altered a bit. Okay. Before being touched by uh, metaphor, the beauty of metaphor, you are actually extremely graspy about your selfhood. Okay, this is me, this is me, this is me. Okay. Uh, it's only a, a exposure to liberal arts education that, that makes you at one point say, okay, this might <coughs> not be all that there is to this game. Maybe uh, I could be different. Maybe I could uh, have... And then the point is recovery of joy of a different kind, you know. Uh, the, uh, ha have you heard of this phrase called negative capability? What, what do you understand by that phrase? Negative capability. It comes from Keats. The ability for sadatmya. Sadatmya is a ability to resonate. Okay. Uh, you know, the, have you, do you know about this word anukampa? Kampa is to vibrate. Anukampa is to vibrate with. There's a beautiful story about uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. He's walking uh, down the uh, banks of Ganges uh, in poverty-stricken Calcutta. And he sees that in the early morning, in the hutments of uh, Calcutta, there is a situation where the uh, child is asking for food, okay, very small child, there is no food at home, and the mother is angry, frustrated, she pulls out a cane and starts thrashing the child, okay, purely out of frustration. And this man just watches for a while and then moves away. And when the attender uh, of his, uh, when he comes back home, removes the shawl from his back, he finds cane marks on the back of uh, Paramahamsa, okay? And uh, Flaubert, when he was describing an allergic character, okay, a character which had allergy in the novel, developed skin rashes. So there is a certain intersubjectivity that we actually uh, lock into by living with characters. and. Uh, the Gandhian notion of this is called Swaraj. For you, Swaraj comes as a, a political term, Rajya. Okay. So, what is the root meaning of Swa? Self. Okay. Raj is space. Self, space. That, that's what it means. Uh, if you don't consciously cultivate a sense of space, the only choice you have is eternal constriction, okay? And you see constriction all over the place. If you look around, people want identity fragmentation. I'm not only uh, Indian, I'm not, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm Karnataka, in Karnataka, I'm from Ballari, in Ballari, I'm Mulukanadu, in Mulukanadu, I'm left-handed, you know? It goes on like this till the end, okay? 
Okay? And uh, this, and th the problem is, please understand, literature speaks in a very defensive, apologetic voice, but it has no sense of apology. It has no sense of fear. Its only mission is speak truth to power. Speak truth to power at any cost. At any cost. So uh, when when this happens, uh, you will slowly, if, when your reading begins to mature, you begin to see intercultural universes. This is another stage of relating to literature. <laughs> You know how many centuries separate Alama and uh, Shakespeare? Lots. Alama is from which century? 12th century. Okay, 11th, 12th century. Uh, and he he looks about uh, the the uh, the mass of humanity, and he talks about sasiveyas to sukhke, sagradash to dukkha. Look at this. Sasiveyash to Sukhakke, Sagaradash to Dukkha. That is his commentary on life. For the happiness of a size of a mustard, you have a misery of the proportion of an ocean. Okay. And you look at one sonnet of Shakespeare. He says, I am sure you would have read this sonnet. Past reason wanted, no sooner had, past reason hated. It is a commentary on human desire. Our appetite for the menu is always greater than our appetite for the food. Okay? Uh, do, do you get this point? The, and this is what, uh, and natural selection tricks you by saying that, okay, relief is just that two miles from now, then three miles from now. It wants to get its genes traveled across to the next generation. That is all it wants. And it gets you to go around it. Uh, Richard Dawkins' selfish gene makes uh, this uh, point. Uh, and uh, when when you look at uh, also what, what little kind of resource it takes to be happy with a strong inner life, Bendre was a Kannada poet. He had just two lines. I don't know if you will. I will translate it. Kavi manada vyasara harise harisoke hechige nu beka kuta hunise marasaka. Do you get this? For the sensibility of a poet to please him, what more does it take? Just a tamarind tree. So, uh, the point that it also uh, brings you to is that uh, sensory amplification, ethical maturity of a very different kind. The ethical maturity given by faith-based religions are very different from the ethical maturity literature offers you. There is a difference. Okay. Uh, the most... Uh, traditional ethical training is in opposition to something okay if i if i have to be a good uh, ex religionist then my dogmatic uh, parity with the other person is is not acceptable it's it's not on you know i i just want to i want you to understand with a little laxity in public morality, what kind of disasters can happen? Did you see that we have never heard of lynchings before? And there are people who will say that uh, this is because a certain community behaves in a particular way. So this is, we don't know how to handle difference. Literature the ethics of literature teaches you to handle difference, to coexist with difference. 
the answer for difference is not elimination, but a kind of inclusive compassion, which uh, only, uh, but the, the other difficulty is that the midpoint between the excesses of religion and the sublimity of, uh, of uh, you know, literature, which I would locate in the so-called industry of self-development. Have you, uh, you know, self-development, personality development, value education. Okay, but the problem is all these programs are actually constructing a certain kind of uh, solid self-confidence that does not hold, okay? Uh, euphoria and dysphoria are both truths of existence. What is dysphoria? Dysphoria is that things are not okay. And literature teaches you it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. And you don't have to pretend you, you don't have to pretend that everything is all right. Everything will be all right. If this uh, opposition is not there, I am fine. If this uh, ethnic group is not there, I am fine. Uh, these things sound very simple, but because people have stopped saying this aloud, the repercussions have been uh, more than tragic, more than tragic. And uh, fundamentally, it leads you to a state of biophilia. Please understand it. Okay? Biophilia is when you are able to embrace not just uh, the human species, you are able to say it. Okay? Uh, you are able to say yes to uh, uh, you know, everything that exists within the biosphere. And this sounds like religion, but because it is non-dogmatic, and it takes you to a kind of recovery of the kind uh, of the type that you will see in uh, Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is also uh, a culmination of Mahayana Buddhist tradition, where the uh, concerned person is offered heaven. He says, come, you have, you have accrued so much religious merit, you please come to heaven, I will take you to heaven. And he says, uh, sorry, I will find heaven very uh, unattractive. I want to see that the last blade of grass is liberated from misery, from uh, dukkha, from uh, a sense of unsatisfactoriness. And we have the si similar uh, uh, you know, aspirations, of narr narrative aspirations in uh, uh, Vithala or Vithoba, where a have you heard of uh, this uh, guy called Bhakta Kumbhara? Yes. Okay, it's a mythical character. Uh, he is actually a fine craftsman and he gets into zone while doing his uh, work. That is from where the Basavarna's aspiration of Kayakave Kailasa comes. Okay? And uh, in, when in zone, he is asked by, uh, uh, you know, Krishna wants to see him in action. Because he calls himself the devotee of Krishna. Right? And Krishna knocks on his door and he asks him, uh, he opens the door and uh, Krishna is there and says, I came to see you because you are my bhakta. This guy says, he throws a brick there and says, please stand there. I usually finish 100 parts. I am still on the 67th. Okay? I will finish my 100, then we will have a conversation. And the thought is that if you go to Pandaripura temple, you will see Krishna standing on a brick. Right? So that, that is the kind of... Uh, what I want to tell you here is uh, monochromatism of feeling and cognition is dangerous. Please understand. Monochromatism is single color. Uh, Semitic traditions seem to pro uh, promote this kind of monochromatism. And the problem in Indian sensibility that was not there about 30 years ago has now come in, where they want to semitize Indian sensibility. What is semitize? One book, one way of ch 
worship and one God. Okay? So if you want to make Bhagavad Gita one book, and if you want to make Rama as one God, and if you want to, uh, you know, a certain location or a matha, 12th century Basavarna says that Sthavara Aliwuntu Jangama Kalivela. The moving shall stay, the staying shall fall. So the, this kind of arresting has to be only, uh, you know, detonated by the subversive power of literature. Understand? That's why I say literature is subversive power in the disguise of, uh, you know, very sattvic anger that literature has. You have to let uh, that loose. Now, uh, basically, the last gift that literature gives you, let me uh, spend ten minutes on this, this uh, is your relationship to non-being changes very imperceptibly the more you engage with world literature. I don't know if you understand this. All faith traditions are actually death denials, nothing else. You, you are after immortality, right? The Purandara Dasa also says, Illirudu summane, allirudu nammane. Illirudu summane, allirudu nammane. Okay? It's okay, but we still apply for the BDA site. Okay? <laughs> So, uh, we can't accuse the Purandardas of having done it, but uh, what I mean to say is that fundamentally we are a memory, uh, we are bundles of memory. The last resistance that we have is what if I am not? What if I am not? Are handle that now, not 20, 30, 40 years later. Epictetus, uh, uh, have you heard of Epictetus? Who is Epictetus? A uh, Roman stoic. He simply said, where I am, death is not. When death is, I am not. What is the problem? Do you understand what he is trying to say? All I will be aware of is that I exist. When I know, when death has really taken me, there is no I to miss. So that's what he means to say, when I am, death is not. When death is, I am not. Okay? So this takes us to uh, Marcus Aurelius's formulation, that we are all on a temporary holiday from non-existence. Understand this. You are on a long sail, casually. Okay. <laughs> you did not miss you not being in 1800. You? Not much. You won't miss you not being around in 2090, though I want you to, to live to be 100. Yeah? What is this? all this fuss about? So the first thing that really... Uh, tells you when you have cognitive sophistication, which is the strength of literature. Understand this, cognitive sophistication. We always live a series of small deaths. Where is the eight-year-old you? Where is the six-year-old you? Where is the four-year-old you? Okay. So, you actually have a small narrow band and we are holding on to it like nobody's business, my God. But we are made up of a series of micro deaths. So if you look at uh, the Greek vision of tragedy, which is the birth of uh, Western civilization and uh, literally imagination, uh, why was Socrates so, if you look at the painting of Socrates,
secret is taking that hemlock. He's trying to uh, explain a point to his, uh, uh, his disciple and he says, okay, let the hemlock wait. He's not afraid of it. <coughs> so, uh, the point is that when we construct meta-narratives for which we have to live, whatever it is, in uh, one uh, in one tradition it could be Indra Loka. What is Indra doing full time? Watching Rambha, Menaka, Urvashi. 24 by 7, that is his job. Okay. And uh, the Jainas have a story, a literary, uh, uh, you know, gem. Rambha is, uh, Parshvanatha is called by Indra to sit in Indra Sabha and watch uh, you know, Rambha dancing. And uh, these guys, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, Jaina imagination believes in rebirth and reincarnation. So while he is watching, he finds that for a micro, in a microsecond, Ramba has lost her life and she is moving into the next life. And her moving hands and legs stop for a nanosecond. At that point, he moves into Vairagya and leaves the... Okay. And if you look at the Bahubali narrative, just at the time, just before killing his brother, he says, yeah, it's, it's not worth it. So, uh, the fear of death is called thanatophobia. The fear of death is thanatophobia. And one of the things that uh, uh, a lifetime study of literature gives you, I think, is to let go in increasing degree of thanatos or fear of. Okay? That's why in Indian literary imagination, the worst punishment that gods can think of, it is given to Yayati. Okay? And the gods give that punishment. You, you are immortal. You will be given immortality. But you constantly age. Imagine. You age and age and age and age, but you don't. I'm, I, no other literary tradition has ever thought of a worse, uh, uh, you know, naraka, what is uh, hell, right? So, essentially, uh, what should your, uh, uh, you know, engagement with literature do? First, give you, uh, you know, what, what in Sanskrit literature is called Brahma Vihara. Brahma, see, the word Brahma or Brahmachari is somehow translated as a celibate. Brahmachari means one who is a celibate. But true meaning of Brahmachari is charana means movement. Brahma means great expanse. A person who has facility of moving in the world of ideas, of great ideas, he is a Brahmachari. Okay. So, uh, first thing it, uh, it gives you is the ability to dialogue with the past because your sense of time and space increase. Imagine dialoguing with, see people who are alive are generally fussy. Okay, they have, they are caught up in their own hassles. So I don't know if Shakespeare would have been a great friend. He might have been, a, I mean, if you ask Socrates his wife, how was Socrates? She will tell you, let him go to hell. <laughs> The Socrates that you are dealing with is a Socrates that is dialoguing with you from the past. This is the gift of the past. All the kahi is taken out and only amruta remains. But the wearer of the shoe knows where it, the shoe pinches. So wife of Socrates knows what a headache he would have been. Okay. Right? So, but uh, what this uh, really does to you is that you have a galaxy of voices from the past to interact with. It's amazing. It's really amazing. And if you have a strong, lovely, vibrant reading life, you don't have this 
sense of boredom, this American obsession with having fun. I, small, small children will say, parents are asking, how are you having fun? Are you having fun? Are you having fun? Why should you have fun all the time? It's not required. It's such a lousy thing to have fun all the time. It's an utter poverty of imagination to have fun all the time. Do you get this? Unfortunately, uh, only one thing that we get without any qualification is parenting. Right? So, uh, therefore, uh, what, 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 so the first thing is uh, if you have spent some time in the world of letters, world of books, slowly voices, you are not hallucinating, by voices I mean, past begins to be present to you in a way, very interesting ways. So every year on a birthday, you should tell yourself, who are the five or six people from history that I would take out for dinner tonight? You don't have to pay. You don't even have to use a credit card. That's the beauty, right? You have a table for five. You are one. Who are the other four? This is the way to assess how you have grown in one year. Okay. So, it, it, it's extremely important to understand that this is an ongoing process of maturing, a journey without destination. Remember this, journey without, in all literary traditions you have metaphors for this which is Aniketana is one. Aniketana is homeless. Okay? There's a small difference between Anagarika and Anagarika. Look at this. Anagarika is one who doesn't have a dwelling city. Anagarika is one who is not civilized. It's a huge difference. So, uh, by simulation, I mean, you have an extremely special, uh, special uh, relationship. The past comes alive to you according to your frequency and bandwidth. Please remember all, even reading habits, even books that you choose. The book chooses you and you choose the book. It's always a two-way thing. And that, that you are never truly lonely. You might be alone, but you will never truly ever be lonely if you have a life of literature. That's, that's number one. The second uh, important thing is that uh, you, you can forgive a lot in yourself and in others. You, you, know, you don't carry the uh, load of Bitterness. Bitterness is, uh, it slowly it erases out and lastly, you don't actually want to live forever. Okay? You only live once and that's more than enough if you have lived right. And uh, uh, essentially, if I last thing I want to leave you is with is five names. If you have never been a very serious reader of literature, just read these five people. Okay? Short ex extracts. Read two plays of Shakespeare. Okay, people say you have to go to Varanasi or you have to go to Mecca before you die. I also say you should read some things before you die. Okay? <laughs> And unfortunately, neither the government of any country has thought of giving subsidies for reading. They should. It's a much better investment, actually. Right? So, uh, please read two plays of Shakespeare, at least in the minimum. One is King Lear. I think it is. Uh, I'll 
with you. He talks about a, 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 a line there which is called ripeness is all. Ripeness is all. And it's actually, literature is a <coughs> catalyst for ripening. Amazing. And uh, the second play that uh, you should absolutely read for certain passages in it, which speak to you directly. Have you heard of As You Like It? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Then, straight away, come to Kannada or your local language. See, in MA, I had this experience of, uh, uh, you know, joining Bangalore University, big, big books, uh, uh, you know, 40 novels in two years. You don't understand what is Wessex, what is Thomas Hardy, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, what's what is going on about daffodils. We don't, you know, daffodils go pregnant, we don't know. But uh, you have paid the fees, you are a colonized, uh, you know, people have some hopes about you, okay. So you can't pretend that you... Uh, that's the point. You, you, you get this. And uh, on the one side, you're sitting in a classroom, trigonometry is going on. The doctor, uh, I mean, I think it was Father Rexina who was there, who said, cos square theta plus sin square theta equals 1. My question was, so what? <laughs> Crushed by the universe. But of 
its victory, the universe knows nothing, while man knows he is dying. In that is his triumph. Can I repeat this? You try and understand. Yes, man will be crushed by the universe. But of its victory, the universe knows nothing. But man knows that he is dying. He is aware, self-awareness. That is his victory. Right? So uh, what, what, what this tells you is, you don't need any kind of uh, uh, you know, ratification from others, a kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, applause from others, a kind of certificate from others. You know, the kind of American public education system where there's a convocation for third standard, there's a convocation for fifth standard, there's a convocation for, you know, for, you don't have to over, uh, you know, uh, uh, reinforce uh, minor achievements. So, in, that's why Emerson says, virtue is enough. Virtue is enough. So, fundamentally, if you look at the 2000 years of classical literary history, the one thing that comes right across from different quarters is that being virtuous is like taking bath. You don't take it, take bath for an ulterior motive. You know, it's nice. Okay. So, uh, so that kind of uh, space, that kind of modulation, and that kind of connection comes to you when you dedicate hopefully when you dedicate a life for literature. Thank you so much for your attention. We can continue in form of questions. So.